So hello everybody, my name is uh, Victor, and today I'm here to talk about what's new in Docker. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Um, so here's the quick agenda for today. First, I'm going to talk about uh, versioning. Then I'm going to go over all the new features that were added to the builder recently. Then talk about runtime, swarm mode, and I'm going to finish uh, with uh, Compose. So the new versioning. Uh, back in March, we changed the versioning of uh, Docker. Before, it used to be 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, and in March, we switched to the year.month uh, versioning system, so 17.03, 17.04. It's kind of like uh, Ubuntu. And um, as you can see here in the version, uh, we're also appending dash CE. CE means uh, Community Edition. It's uh, the free product uh, Docker, Docker distributes uh, that everybody can use freely. And uh, it's opposed to EE, which is our enterprise edition. And so now, now in the version itself, you can see either if you're on the CE version or the EE version. And with uh, this new versioning, we also introduced a whole new release schedule. So I know there is a lot of information on this slide, but uh, bear with me, it's, it's quite simple actually. So on the top part of the slide, we have Docker CE, so Community Edition. And if you want to install Docker CE, you basically have two choices. We call those uh, channels. You can use the Edge channel. It's going to be released monthly, so 17.04, 05, 06, 07, and so on and so on. And it's when you want to try the, the bleeding edge feature of Docker, when you really always want to have the latest version of Docker, you should use the Edge uh, channel. Every month, you're going to get a new release with uh, all the, the newest feature. If you want something uh, more stable, we have the stable channel. This one is going to be released quarterly, so 17.03, 17.06, 17.09. And it's going to be supported for four months. And I mean, that's, that's very important because here, for example, uh, in June, we're going to release 17.06, but 17.03 will still be available for a whole month. So we have, we basic, you basically have one month to upgrade where we support two versions, we backport security and important fixes uh, if, if needed. So this new release schedule has uh, basically two main advantages that are, are helping uh, the quality of, of uh, the Docker product. The first one is we are releasing often every month. Um, so what was happening before is when we were going to do, do a new release, tons of contributors were rushing features at the last minute uh, because if you were missing, for example, 112, you had no idea when uh, 113 was going to be released. And uh, in this example, it was six months, so a really long time. And so it meant like just before cutting 112, we, we got tons of pull requests and it was really hard to manage on the, on the open source uh, side. Right now it's, it's much bigger, it's much better, sorry, because we basically release every month. So if, if for example, you miss 1704, for your feature, that's okay. You know that a month after, um, the, the feature uh, is going to, be, going to be here. So yeah, we're releasing more often uh, and it's going to, to help the, the quality of the, of the product. And the second main advantage I, I talked about already is you basically have one month where two versions are supported at the same time. In the past, for example, the day we released uh, 112, we, we uh, 1.11 was not supported anymore. Basically, as soon as we released the new version, you, you had to upgrade. Um, with this new release schedule, you have one month when we support both. So it's, you, you have some, some time to, to upgrade. And lastly, to finish on this slide, at the bottom here, we have uh, Docker EE. It's our enterprise edition. This one is going to be released uh, quarterly as well, but it's going to be supported for, four for 12 months. So for a whole year, we're going to backport security fixes uh, and important fixes. And so again, talking about the release schedule, all the features I'm going to show today are available on uh, 1705 uh, RC1, so the first release candidate of uh, the 1705 uh, version. As uh, you can see, the version is going to be released in May, but the first release candidate is, is available today, so you can, you can get it and play with those features. And also I want to mention, on the top right corner, I, I'm specifying on which uh, version the feature was introduced for all the feature slides. So you know if you do need the latest RC or, or if 
for example, on, on Docker for Mac, maybe you already have uh, 1704, and some features I'm, go I'm going to talk about are already in, in 1704. All right, let's uh, dive into the features now. And let's start with the builder. So there was lots of work uh, done on the, on the builder during the past few months, uh, mostly of the, of the backend. We completely rewrote how the backend of the builder works internally. And it allows us to do much more complex operation when we are building images. And uh, one of uh, the new features we can do with the, with the, the change we made is a multi-stage build. So you saw, you saw a demo this morning at the, at the keynote, uh, but I'm just going to go over it uh, and maybe with uh, some more details. So on the left side, this is how the internals of the builder uh, was working before. It was something really linear. Uh, the output of one step was uh, used to create the next step and so on and so on. And I mean, it, it works, but the, one of the issues, for example, here is if I need to change the step number two, it's going to invalidate all the cache, and I'm going, uh, we'll have to redo step three and step four. Basically, everything that is under the step two will have to be re rebuilt. And uh, it, it's, it's, sometimes it might be an issue. For example, step two and three don't really have to be related sometimes, so it makes no sense when you are changing step two to, to change step three as well. So what we did uh, with the backend changes is that uh, now instead of having something linear, all the steps are basically represented as a graph. So I, I put an example on the right side. Um, so you see here, step two and three are not really related, so I could change step two, it wouldn't impact step three. And uh, using this new backend, uh, we introduced a multi-stage multi -stage build in the Docker file. So let's take a, an example. Here I'm taking a very basic and simple example to build a C++ application. So the first line, I'm, I'm using a base image. In this case, I'm using Ubuntu. It's one of uh, the most popular we have today on the hub. I'm installing the, the build dependencies, like make and GCC in this case, and the source code of my application. I'm compiling the application, and uh, at the bottom here with the expose and entry point, I'm basically explaining how to to run your application, what's the configuration needed to run to run your application? This Docker file looks great and works great, but um, the main issue here is the image that is going to be produced by this Docker file. It's going to be huge, and it's going to be huge uh, for multiple reasons. But the the main one is, in this image, you will have basically your your build environment. You will have make GCC your source code, and you will have your runtime environment, so the uh, compiled application and, and how to configure it. And when you run your application, you, you don't need make, you don't need GCC, and uh, you definitely don't need the source code. So let's see how we can uh, improve this. The first uh, in easy, easy step is to change the base image. Uh, instead of using Ubuntu that is quite big, most of the time you, you, don't, need, uh, you don't need it. Uh, you can use a, a simpler uh, and smaller base image. So here I cho choose uh, Alpine. And basically, the Docker file is uh, pretty much the same. The image produced by this Docker file is going to be smaller, of course, but the, the main issue is still here. You have your build environment and your runtime environment in the same image. So to fix uh, this issue, we saw multiple projects uh, on the community starting using two different Docker files. One Docker file that is at the top here for your build environment, and one Docker file uh, that is for your runtime environment. And um, basically in the middle, using some shell scripting or some make file to uh, run the first Docker file, extracting the binaries and putting it into the, the second Docker file. So this is it's exactly the output we want. We want a tiny image with uh, just uh, your application. The main issue here is it requires using a make file or a shell script. So you're losing portability. Now you go to a project and you're not sure how to, how to build it. Every project builds in a different way and uh, it's, not, it's not really practical. So with a uh, multi-stage build, uh, we solved uh, the problem. This is one Docker file and within the same Docker file, as you can see, I have the from line twice. So in the top part, I'm doing the from and I'm basically labeling this part of the Docker file as my build environment with the as keyword. 
And then within the same Docker file, I have another from, and I just have this uh, copy line here that says, take the application from um, the, the first stage and copy it into the current stage. So it's going to produce the exact same uh, output as uh, this method, but here you don't need make file or you don't need shell script. You can just do a simple Docker build and that's it, it's going to produce uh, the smallest uh, image possible. Um, so let's, let's take a look at a more complicated example uh, and a real life example. I'm going to open a project called uh, Dockercraft. It was um, shown a couple of uh, Docker cons ago. It's a, it's a cool hack. It's basically a Minecraft client when you can uh, walk into your, your containers. But here, the, I want to focus on the Docker file. The project is not, not that important. If we look at the Docker file here, it's, um, it's um, like not that big. Uh, it's doing a from a Golang. And basically, if I, if I split it, we ha I have three main dependencies. Here, I'm, we need the Docker client. Here, we need a software called uh, Kubernetes. It's actually a Minecraft server in, in C++. And here, I'm, I need the the Docker Craft tools code and I need to compile the actual application. And so, again, this Docker file works. Uh, the problem is the image is really, really big. So we can use a multi-stage build to, to make it uh, smaller. And uh, I opened the pull request a couple days ago. And if I look at the make file here, it's uh, slightly more complicated, but it, it, it's just produced a way, way uh, smaller and uh, efficient uh, image. So basically, I'm, I split every dependency I talked about into its own, own stage. Uh, so you see I have a from here that uh, I label Docker. So this part of the Docker file is going to take care of downloading Docker. This part of the Docker file is going to take care of uh, Kubernetes. And, and same for Dockercraft. And after, I just have a, a quite small uh, base image uh, where I'm copying all the, only the artifact I need for runtime into the, the last stage. Uh, so I did uh, some uh, drawings to, to explain what, what just happening. So the previous Docker file, the first Docker file I show you, was again, was really linear. I was uh, installing wget and then Docker, Kubernetes, Dockercraft, and explaining how to, to run it. Uh, again, the issue here is, for example, if I want to update the version of Docker, it's going to force me to re-download Kubernetes. And in this, this case, that makes no sense because the two are not related. So uh, it's going to be a waste of time and the image is going to be, to be big in the end. This is uh, what's uh, the drawing of the Docker file of the, the pull request I opened. Um, so as you can see, Kubernetes and Docker are, are the same level. I can change the version of Docker. It won't impact uh, the Kubernetes step. I can change uh, the Kubernetes step and it won't impact uh, the, the Docker one. And uh, in the end, uh, if we look at the size of the images, it's the, the resulting images is really, really small uh, compared to the, to the first one. Uh, and, and basically in the, in the resulting image, you simply have your base layer, uh, the Docker binary, uh, the Kubernetes, and, and the Dockercraft binary. You, do, you don't end up with any, any, uh, any build dependencies or anything like this. The image is it's, uh, really neat, lean and it's really the smallest, uh, the smallest possible. So again, it's in the top right corner. This feature was introduced in 1705. So if you link the release candidate one, you can test uh, those features today. Uh, next feature also related to multi-stage build. Uh, we added a dash dash target uh, on Docker build. So if I look at uh, the Docker file here, uh, if you do a Docker build without specifying anything, it's going to, to produce and tag basically the last, uh, the last stage, so the last from. Um, but uh, if, for example, you want to specifically build this stage, so the Kubernetes stage, and basically it would Docker build and stop just here, uh, you, can do, you can do so with the dash dash target um, argument on, on Docker build. And uh, lastly, uh, again about uh, the builder, I want to talk about also another feature that was introduced very recently and that's uh, very powerful. We now allow you to use uh, the arg keyword, so build, ar build argument, into the from on your Docker file. Here I showed a quick example to, to explain how, how, what you can do with it, for example. 
So here, the first line of this Docker file is going to be an arg, so I'm defining an ar argument. I'm, I'm naming it uh, Go version here and, and defaulting to, to 1.8. And then in the from, I'm using this argument as, as a tag of the application, so the rest of the Docker file, it's a typical uh, Golang Docker file. And so here, if I do a Docker build, it's going to use a Golang column 1.8 uh, image, so it's going to use Golang 1.8 to build my application but uh, I can specify a build argument with the dash dash build uh, dash arg as, uh, as shown at the bottom. And basically I can change the Go version I want to use by uh, changing the tag of my image. So again, we saw some project that, has, that had multiple Docker files for multiple versions of uh, Go or, or, or basically any, any, any language. And now you don't have to have multiple Docker files, you can just change the version using, uh, using a build, build argument. And so here I don't have uh, too much time to dive into details, but basically if you, can com if you combine the multi-stage build plus the arg in from, you can do really, really complex operations on your Docker file. You can have a very smart Docker file. Um, we, we made lots of those changes on the back end, uh, a, few, a few of the, on the front end, so on the Docker file, but uh, you should expect a more, more changes to come, more improvements to come on the, on the builder and um, in, the, in the future versions. Now let's talk about the runtime. Uh, first, uh, this one was introduced in 1703. We introduced some data management commands. Uh, so I've been working at Docker for four years, and one of the most common requests we always had, mo most common issue was basically, where is my disk space? Uh, why is Docker using so much space? Uh, how can I clean up? So we, we finally uh, still solved the issue with the Docker system GF command. It's going to print you to show you all the space used by Docker and basically what, what uh, percentage of this space you can reclaim because it's not used. So here in this example, I do a system GF and uh, Docker tells me I have currently five images, but only one is used. So I have four images that are unused. All the images, uh, the size is 2.7 gigs, uh, but actually, I could remove 95% of, of the size because uh, it's uh, all the unused images. Uh, then we have the same for containers and volume. So same here. I have four volumes, but I'm only using one, so I, re I could remove three volumes and basically reclaim 2.2 uh, gigabytes. And so with systemdf, you can diagnose, you can see what's, what's wrong with the size, and you can, you can uh, know how to clean up your, your Docker instance. We also added Docker system prune that is actually going to remove every, every space that is reclaimable. So if you do a Docker system prune in this case, it's going to warn you, are you sure? You press yes, and then it's going to tell you, I just reclaimed, in this case, like five gigabytes of RAM. Of course, you don't have to prune your entire system. If you simply want to prune containers, you can do a Docker container prune, or if you want to prune, I don't know, images, you can do Docker image prune. Uh, so yeah, that's great comments to basically help uh, prevent um, space uh, being wasted on your, on your Docker instance. Next, I want to talk about the plugins. Um, again, a very, very big feature of, of uh, Docker that was introduced recently. So Docker had plugin for quite some time, actually. I think we introduced them in 1.7 or 1.8. And so those plugins are working uh, great. The main issue was all the maintenance of the plugin, all the management of those plugins, because you had to install the plugin yourself. You had to make sure it was running at all time. If your machine was restarting, for example, you had to make sure your plugin would restart before Docker. All those kind of, of management tasks that are, are quite uh, tedious. So we introduced a new plugin system, and we called it the managed uh, plugin. And that's because all the plugins are actually managed by Docker, by the Docker daemon and they run as container. And they're, so it's, it, they're quite easy to use. You can do, for example, a Docker plugin install, and you give the plugin name, and uh, it's going to pull it from the hub or from the store or from actually even a private registry. It's the same, same uh, mechanism as images. And so that's really easy to install. Then you can enable or disable your plugin with uh, some commands. And here I, I just put an example with a plugin set. You can specify, for example, an environment variable or uh, if you want to change the mount inside the plugin, you can do you can do so with a plugin set. So 
yeah, plugins, it's a really important feature. It basically can, you can add new volume drivers, you can add new logging driver into Docker without having to recompile uh, the Docker. Docker. Um, you can add them at, at runtime. So here it's a great example uh, I made. It's, uh, it has a, a simple repo, readme, sorry, that uh, shows you how you can compile uh, the plugin, how you can uh, run it, and how to use it. I want to mention that uh, tomorrow in this room at 1.30, there is a deep dive session uh, about plugins, so how to build, ship, uh, store, and, and run your plugins, uh, also how to debug them. So if, if you're interested in this new, uh, in this new uh, plugin system, I encourage you to, to come to this session tomorrow. Next, swarm mode. Um, the first uh, feature I want to talk about is uh, synchronous service command. So today in swarm mode, if you're doing a service create or if you're doing a service update, basically the CLI is going to return right away. You have no way to know if, if this is still in progress. You have no way to know if it worked or if it fails. And that's because it's by design. I mean, it's because it's, it's asynchronous. But sometimes you want to have asynchronous things. It's easier when you want to script and you want to have, uh, I don't know, a shared script with multiple commands. Um, and yeah, sometimes it's just good to see, to see did the command work or not. So uh, we added uh, synchronous service commands, uh, and I'm going to do a quick, a quick demo about those. Just to mention, on this demo, I'm going to use a tool called Play with Docker. It was made by two Docker captains, and uh, it's basically a great tool that gives you a, a playground around Docker and um, allows you to, to test the newest uh, version. So let me open the tool. I'm not a robot. And uh, hopefully the network will be good. Uh, yeah, let's, let's come back to it later. But uh, yeah, basically you, you see that it's going to, for every replicas, here in this example I'm starting a Redis service with five replicas. So you see I have a progress bar for each replica. You can see the state, so three of them are in starting, two of them are actually running, and you see the progress bar moving all the way. Um, and at the top you have an overall progress bar, so it's, it's quite intuitive to see, okay, is my, is my service uh, completely, completely operational or, or not yet. Next one is uh, service rollback. Uh, it's also a, a very cool feature. So in the past, so before 1704, when you are doing a service update and a failure was happening, you basically had two choices. You had either you would pause, so you, you would pause the update and wait for some uh, human intervention, or you would continue and simply just ignore the failure. In 17.04, we added a, a, four, a third option called a rollback that is basically going to do a um, rollback update. So as soon as we detect a failure, we, we come back to the previous replicas and put back the the previous version that, that was working. Uh, so yeah, great feature, and it came with a bunch of flags. For example, uh, it, it came with, uh, it come with the uh, rollback uh, max failure ratio. So let's say you have a service with uh, 100 replicas, and you want to do an update, but it's acceptable for you that, uh, I don't know, maybe 5% of them uh, fails, it's fine. You can, you can use this flag to say, I only want to trigger a rollback if 6% uh, uh, start failing. So with, with this, you can, you can really uh, basically configure how you want your rollback to happen. Next one is uh, about swarm mode. It's also, it's uh, topology aware scheduling. And for this one, I'm going to, I do some, did some drawings. So here I have uh, a cluster with uh, three nodes. Two, the two nodes on the left are on uh, the rack I called uh, SFO1, and the node on the right is on the rack I called uh, SFO2. And so I have those three nodes, and let's say I want to start a service, and uh, it's a Postgres service with uh, six replicas. So when I do this, basically, uh, Swarm is going to um, spread the containers evenly, node by node. So you're going to end up with uh, something like, that looks like this. And if I do the same thing with my web application, but this time I'm, I'm only putting two replicas, for example, it's um, very likely that you're going to end up in a in a situation like this, because it's going to start by node one and spreading nodes, starting by node one, node two, and, and that's it. So here, I guess, uh, you, see, you see my point, you see the issue. If uh, the rack SFO1 goes down completely, 
you're in trouble because you don't have any web app container on, on the other rack. So with the latest version of, uh, of Docker, you can fix uh, this issue quite easily. Let's uh, start from fresh. And again, I'm going to, to deploy six replicas, but I'm going to add a, a placement preference on uh, the rack itself. So instead of spreading the, uh, the replicas on the node, I want uh, Swarm to spread the replicas on the rack themselves. So if I run the command, it's going to look like this. So if you look at the node level, it's, it's uneven, but if you zoom out and lo look at the rack level, you do have uh, three containers in, in every rack. And so if I do the same with uh, web app, uh, basically the web app containers are going to be split uh, between the two racks. And here you are much, in a much better situation because either one of the racks can fail, uh, you still have um, your application, uh, all the component of your application running on the, on the other rack. And uh, last feature I want to talk about with uh, services uh, are the logs. Uh, we recently added service logs. So here in this example, creating a, again a Redis service with uh, two replicas. And then I can simply do a Docker service logs and uh, it's going to basically print all the logs from all the replicas uh, on the left side. You can see which task is running. So if it's task one or task two, sorry, you can see on which node it's running uh, again. And on the right side, you have the actual uh, log line. So if you've used uh, Docker Compose in the past, it's pretty much the same output. You, we, we mix every replica and, and show you the combined uh, logs. So once again, about Swarm mode, there is deep, deep dive session today in this room at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, there are lots of features I couldn't talk about uh, on Swarm today. So uh, yeah, just check out the session if you're interested about Swarm. Uh, lots of uh, new feature in addition to the one I talked about already. And finally, let's, let's talk about Compose. One of the biggest feature we had at in 1703 was basically the ability to, from a Compose file, start services. So the, we call the feature Compose to Swarm, and it's, it's, it's really easy to use. You basically have to deploy a stack. A stack uh, is a collection of services. And so you do a Docker stack deploy, you give it the Compose file, and you give the, st the stack a name, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it's going to parse your Compose file, it's going to look at all the services, all the networks, all the volumes needed, and it's going to run them um, and to create all of those. After you can manage your stack like any other object uh, with Docker, so you can uh, list your stack with a stack list or remove a stack with a stack remove. Again, when you remove the stack, it's going to remove services, networks, and uh, volumes. And to support this change, we had to basically bump uh, the update, the version of uh, Compose. So the Compose format was, uh, version was updated. Um, we, we went from version two to version three. It, they look similar, but uh, there are a few key differences that uh, are important to understand. So in version three, we removed all the non-portable options, uh, build, for example, or volume from those options didn't really make sense in a clustered environment, so they are not supported. And we added a bunch of uh, Swarm-specific options, such as the number of replicas you want to use or the mode of your service. Is it a global service? Is it a replicated service? And so, yeah, that's, that's the key differences. Um, let's uh, do a quick demo. Hopefully, this time it works. So uh, let's uh, open this one. So, yeah, here it's... Um, a compose file. So as you can see here, it's, it says version three. It, it, it has a look, it's a compose file, so it looks like a regular compose file. I have a Redis service with image and ports as, as usual. But here I have uh, one of the newest keyword, uh, it's a deploy. And basically in this section, I can specify parameters for Swarm. So I can say I want two replicas. I can configure how I want uh, the rolling update to happen. And uh, I can say what to do in case of failures. If I look at the next service, uh, the DB service, again, pretty standard, this part, and here we have the deploy keyword, and it's big. I, here I'm specifying that I want a constraint. I want this, this uh, DB to run on the manager node, so I can do this with uh, this constraint. And we have lots of uh, services in this compose file, and if we look at the end, it, you have two networks, front end and back end, and we also have uh, one volume. So let's see if uh, the tool, uh, yeah, the tool seems to be working now. Um, just going to make sure I have the latest version. So 
here I'm creating an instance. Um, let me do a Docker version. All right, so this is uh, 17.05 uh, RC1. So as I said, it's available today. And so first, uh, let's uh, create a swarm. It's uh, really easy, so I'm just simply going to do a Docker swarm in it and specifying uh, my advertise address. So I'm here I'm creating a manager, and I can simply copy-paste this line, add new instances. And so here I have node two, I paste the line, and it's joined at the worker, and I can do the same, same thing a third time. Join as a worker. So if I come back to the first one and I do a Docker node LS, you see I have three nodes um, and I'm currently on the leader. So here just just a, a quick note. It's how easy it is to create a swarm on, on the tool play with Docker. It's just a couple of copy paste and that's it. I have three machines on a swarm and I can I can I have my playground, I can I can test uh, things with it. And so let's uh, take back the compose file here. So I'm going to just simply w get the compose file here and as I said in the slide it's uh, very simple just one command docker stack deploy I give it the compose file and I'm going to uh, name it like app for example so if I do this uh, as I said it's going to parse the compose file it's going to create three networks uh, default one and then the two networks I asked uh, in the compose file, so the back end, the front end, and it's going to to create all the services. Um, then I can uh, do a Docker stack list. I have one stack with uh, six services inside that is named app, and I can do a Docker stack services, give it the name of this stack, and um, you see here all the services. So some of them are still starting. I see this one, the worker is not started yet, but uh, should be should be starting uh, pretty soon. Let me do a, a service again. Okay, so everything now, or everything is uh, is started. So, just uh, to show you how it uh, how it looks like. So, here on the compose file, the last uh, service it's a visualizer, and uh, here I say I want to to publish this visualizer on the port 8080. So, thanks to the Swarm uh, networking uh, model, I can open the port 8080 on on any machine. And it's go I'm going to be redirected to uh, to the the visualizer service. So here I don't I don't even have to know on which which actual instance on which node is the visualizer. I I don't I don't care really. I can just open the port 8080 on on any machine, and uh, once I have uh, internet, uh, it will display a nice uh, visualizer with all the um, all the um, all the containers in it. Uh, looks like it's gonna take some time, so I'm going to continue in the slides and, and come back uh, to this one a bit a bit later. The last uh, thing I want to, to talk about um, regarding Compose is the new syntax we introduced. So here it's an example, it's uh, for the ports, and this one is the old syntax, the current syntax you can use in a Compose file. And it's very important to understand here that every line is a different port. And so the first one, it's quite simple. I want to expose the port 3000, fairly simple. The next one, it's when you want to expose, expose a range. So use a little dash in the middle. Next, it, it starts to get tricky because here I want to expose a container from a, uh, sorry, expose a port from a container to my host. You do have to remember which one is container, which one is host. Even myself, sometimes I, I always forget which one is which. So it's with a column in the middle. You can do the same with ranges. And then again, it's even, even more complicated because you can specify in which IP you want to expose your port. So you have to remember that it's IP, colon, container port, colon, um, host port. And uh, you can also add ranges in the mix and it gets really, really complicated. And lastly, the last line, I want to expose a port and I want to specify the protocol. So here it's UDP. So I mean, all those examples, they work, but you have to remember this, this micro formatting. Uh, you have to remember where are the, the elements. We, we had to do this for the CLI because when you, when you want to, we don't want to pass like 15 flags on the CLI. So using a micro format made sense in the CLI. But here we're in the YAML file. So we, we can do, we can do something, uh, something better. And so we introduced uh, the long syntax, 
It's basically here I'm taking the last line, just the last part, and I'm, I'm writing it into the, the long syntax. So of course it's, it's more verbose, but it's also much more easier to remember. You don't have to, you don't have to, to uh, remember the, the format. It's clearly defined its key value. So my target is uh, 6060. My published port is going to be 7060. And I can also specify uh, the protocol. So I also want to add that uh, here we added uh, swarm specific options as well. Uh, those, this microformat was already like crowded. So there was no way we could add uh, those options here. So if you want to use uh, the new version, the new, the new options for swarm, you have to use uh, the long, the long syntax. Uh, and then I want to talk about the volumes. Um, it's pretty much the same thing here. Every line is a different volume. So the first one, it's an anonymous volume. It's quite simple. The next one, you want to bind some, some repo, some uh, directory from your host inside your container. So here again, you have to remember which one is which, which one is the host, which one is the container. Next line, it's the same with a, with a relative path. The fourth line gets even more complicated because it's, it's, it's a, it's a named volume that here is named data volume that you want to put in a specific path in your container. And the last one, it's a bind. But as you can see here at the end, uh, there is RO. It's to say you want to bind as read only. So again, it works great in the CLI, but it's, it's quite complicated to remember all of those, uh, options in the micro format. And so we introduced a link syntax, long syntax for volumes as well. If we take the last example uh, and we write it in the long syntax, it's much more uh, clearer now. You just specify the type. So again, it's key value. Here you specify it's a bind. So there is no confusion. It's not volume. Uh, you specify the source, the target, and if it's uh, read only or not. So again, it's, it's more verbose, but it's also a more, uh, it's also like easier to remember and easier to use. Uh, let's, let's see if, uh, the, Okay, so if I come back to the, to the previous demo, it's, it actually started. And so here I have a visualizer with uh, all the, all the, all the containers I, I started. So here the point I really want to make is I, I, I just downloaded one compose file on my, on the machine. I did one command, uh, docker stack deploy, and it created all those containers across multiple nodes. Um, and all the containers that are, are working together. Uh, and are, are communicating together. It was it was just uh, one simple uh, line, so that's just um, pretty pretty efficient. So that's it for for the features. Uh, just don't forget to vote for the sessions uh, in the mobile application. You can vote uh, and give comments also. So it's really interesting to give comments so I can improve for the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for such an amazing talk. Um, if anybody would like to come line up here, we can start passing the mic down. Really quick one, Victor. How sure. do you make um, swarm nodes, well, not necessarily rack aware, but you talked about two racks, SFO1, SFO2, and how is it different to constraints? So I, I, I forgot to mention that. Great question. It's basically when you, when you start your Docker engine, uh, you're specifying a label. So it's, it's label based. So here when I, when I started, uh, let me go back here. On a node one and two, when I started Docker, uh, the Docker daemon, I say, okay, you're, you're, I'm going to label you, uh, as a rack equal SFO. So you have to apply labels to your engine. And then we're using those labels as, uh, as a plus placement preference. Um, hi, question about the uh, multi-stage builds. Yes. Um, it seems that every, every copy statement in a multi-stage build uh, is, is effectively creating or implying a contract with the previous image. In other words, that all, everything that's needed will be in that directory. It won't, it won't move around or change. Um, have you guys given any thought to what the implications of that are and whether it needs to be formalized, what that contract is? So, so far, uh, we are, let me again, Go back to the slide. Um, all right. So, so far we are really expecting all the stages to be in the same Docker file. So here, I mean, since it's within the same Docker file, we can make sure that here we, when we, when we say the copy from and we go to SSC build up, 
uh, it's going to be present because it's, it's within the same Docker file, it's above. Uh, yeah, we, we are thinking about a way maybe for the first stage to, to basically expose what, what it can, what it can, uh, what can be copied from it. Uh, and it's probably a feature that's coming in the, in the future versions. Right, because even in this example, it's all one file, but you're, act, you, you're copying from the first file, but actually you're assuming things about Alpine at this point, because an Alpine got pulled in there. So, yeah. I, I so, here, here I'm assuming that my Mac file is going to put the application in SRC build up. That's uh, here, that's the only assumption I have. Yeah, true, but if the, if the copy copied something from the Alpine image, then, then this yeah, whole yeah, can yeah. of worms comes Yeah, out. so, I mean, did you... You have to be careful in the, in the copy. You really have to copy only what you want and not, not the host. Just a quick question. So you touched on the synchronous updates with Docker service. Um, are there any plans maybe by the time 1706 happens to bring that to Docker stack as well? That way you can do a whole deploy and synchronously see when it finishes? Yes, that's definitely something we, uh, we want to do and we're working on. So um, to repeat the, qu the question, all the synchronous commands and services uh, will come to stacks at some point. So you, because here, that's true. When I deployed the stack, everything was asynchronous, so we probably have all the progress bars on the stack deploy as well. Uh, I have a question regarding Docker Compose syntax. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, now there are long form for ports and volumes. And so my first question is that is that just a version 3 thing or is that going to be version 2 as well? And the next one is that what's the future for version 2? Is that going to get deprecated or is that going to be still around? So the new version, the long syntax, it's only on version 3. And, um, I mean, at some point, version 2 is going to be deprecated. Uh, today it's working. It's just you cannot use it with services. Um, but, uh, so basically what's, co what's happening right now is Compose file, you can use it with two software. We have Docker Compose tool in Python. This one understands Compose v3 as well, but just skips uh, what's unsupported because there is, I mean, the replicas, for example, made no sense in the in Compose Python tool. And uh, in Docker itself, you can use uh, version 3 only. So, yeah, I mean, at some point, I guess V2 is going to be deprecated uh, once we have a good answer for the missing features like build and volume from. Uh, that's, why, that's why V2 is still supported today. Okay, so those features are not getting dropped. It's just that once version 3 supports them or we have some alternative for that, then it's version 2 is getting deprecated. Yeah, those features are not dropped. Uh, it's just uh, the build as it's implemented today makes no sense in clustering mode. Once we have a, a way to build images on the fly, we will basically add build and add volume forms, and then basically V2 will, will be the equivalent as V3. Sure. Um, in, in this case here, uh, can I please see the, the second slide? Or sorry, the next slide? What? Um, oh, sorry, the, sorry, the slide right after the one we were just looking at. Oh, uh, yeah. This one? No. Um, no, the, the one where you t tagged the, the different images, the intermediate images. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I have a situation where we want, we have one intermediate build image, and then we want to produce two targets. Each has a different purpose. Um, so would you just use the dash dash target argument twice to get those two yes, images? Yes, yes. Today, Docker build uh, can only produce one image. We okay. only tag one image, so yeah, you would use a dash dash target twice. Okay. So, d Docker build without anything just uses the, d the tag that you give it. Um, yeah, and mo most importantly, it's going to tag the, the latest from in your, it's going to take, for in this, it's going to only tag this image. All these images are going to be built, and you will see them if you do Docker images, but they're going to be untagged. The only tagged uh, image will be the last stage, if you don't specify any target. Okay, and if you use a dash dash target, you can tag t those additional images? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Hi. Uh, just a simple question. Can you deploy multiple stacks on the same nodes? And would the visualizer handle this? So, yes, you can definitely deploy multiple stacks on, on, the, on the, the same node. Basically, when you deploy the stack, you give it a name. And today, how it works, if I look back at the, at the playground, uh, if I do a Docker service ls, you can see that all the services, uh, basically the name is uh, prepended by the stack name. So you can have two stacks with a service DB inside and they won't collide. Uh, 
the visualizer itself, uh, it's, it's really something we built for demos. Uh, so it won't show, basically you can just, you will just see two, two stacks because the names will be different. The names will be different. Yeah. Follow. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hey. Uh, you mentioned the build directive going away with the Docker Compose version 3 syntax. What should folks use in the interim um, if they were relying on the build? So today our answer, our, our answer is uh, if you're using build, it means uh, you're using the Compose uh, Python tool. We would uh, advise to stay on V2. We are not deprecating V2 yet. Uh, and that's because we don't have uh, today a good answer to do a build uh, across the swarm. So today the answer is basically if it's for development for a local machine, we still support V2 and we, we can still continue to use uh, the Python, Python tool. We are looking forward to having the build feature inside V3, inside, inside Docker in the future. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the multi-phase build is really cool. I was wondering uh, what you would suggest for one of the common patterns of, you know, downloading source, doing the make, and then, I mean, you want, you want the result of like your make install to be in a new phase. Yeah. But make install might install a bunch of files, bins, libs, man pages, other shared files. What would be, what would be the pattern you would recommend for, for doing that in an efficient way? So here, uh, where are my slides? Here it's not too much of an issue because in the copy itself, in the copy line, you are specifying exactly what you want to copy. So here I'm, I'm just taking SRC build up. Maybe this make actually made some man pages. Uh, but they're not part of the copy, so they're going, not going to end up in the runtime one. Um, but, if, but, but in the example where you make, you know, you have like a make install rule and it might install, you know, 50 files. Um, so do, do you have any good patterns for how do you, how do you, ca like, and it may change, you know, you update your version of your program and now it installs some other pro files. Do you have to manually go in and find what those files are and do the copy? Yeah, so far, so far it's going to be this, going to be quite manual. You will have multiple copy lines if, if the, what you need for the runtime is in two, two different places. Uh, but we're working on uh, basically changing, changing this. So the first stage could actually say, I'm going to expose this binary and those main pages. And, uh, you wouldn't need one, one multiple copy at the bottom. You would just only need one copy. But it's, it's going to come in the future right now. We are, just one one copy per per artifact you want to bring in your in your runtime, and it's it's quite manual. If if your base layer change, you will have to adapt uh, the second stage. For now. Okay, I guess w sort of what I was looking for is is maybe a way to copy everything generated by one step from a previous stage. That's a good idea. Right now, right now we're using file system, so here in this version we have no way to know what was already in the stage and what was uh, newly produced, but that's a great idea. So, okay. Thank you. I haven't seen it up in anything yet, but is there a possibility of having stacks depend on stacks? Uh, no, it's not a feature that we have today. Um, so the stack to collection of services, no, we don't have this for now. Uh, maybe it's going to come in the future, but uh, it's, it's, to be fair, it's not in our roadmap yet, so but it's a great suggestion. Thank you. Uh, the placement pref, is that available in uh, Compose right now? The V3? Yes, it's available in V3. Okay, uh, and, and did I hear you that it was, it runs off of daemon labels, not node labels? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I mean, it's not really node, it's, it's when you run Docker, you apply labels on the, on the Docker daemon. So, on it's when you're doing the Docker run, or it's in your, I don't know, it, in a systemd init file, you're going to, to specify some labels right. to your daemon. And that's different from the node labels, which you can apply from the command line. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by node labels. Uh, it, it's not, I mean, it, it could be node that you put on, I don't know, AWS or anything. Uh, okay. Those, we don't have access to those. So you, you, it's really had the Docker level that you have to specify those nodes. Sorry, just to clarify. So like in, the, in Docker data center when you're using UCP, you can apply labels to your nodes? Maybe that's just a UCP thing? I, I believe those are the same in the end. I, okay. I believe on UCP when you apply a node label, uh, it ended up applying the, the label on the, on the daemon itself. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm interested in the case of uh, high performance computing. Yeah. Instead of uh, service like containers, uh, interested in containers that take input, start doing some processing, produce output, and then exit dies. Uh, in high performance computing uh, platforms, we have thousands of nodes mm -hmm. in one cluster. 
and Docker currently does not support sharing of image repositories between hosts. So the varlib Docker cannot be shared between two nodes. Is there any effort going to have this possible? Because uh, it is not feasible to have 1,000 replicas of the same image for 1,000 compute nodes in a cluster, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a long time effort and uh, we're working on it right now. Um, there is a talk that uh, is made by uh, the, that is going to talk about the infinite.sh product. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a company that we Docker acquired some, uh, some time ago and they're really into like storage and, and they're actually working on, on having a way to share a valid Docker between, in between images. So the talk won't be about this, but at least you will be able to know the, the technology behind it and uh, probably ask them questions because they know, they know more. But it's definitely something we want to do. We managed to fix, at least to have networks be really well integrated with Docker uh, for storage. We are not there yet, but it's, it's coming. Is it today or? I don't know, I, I don't know. But okay. yeah, it's no, infinite.sh, the yeah. session. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hi, um, it's great to see a new addition to the Docker file. Um, it's one of the major ones since a long time ago, it feels. Um, do you think that opens the way for new improvement to Docker file, potential syntax changes, and things like that? Because I think it was locked down, right? Yes, definitely. So before the builder, the backend was uh, really linear, and the Docker file by itself was the same. It was one line after the other. So we changed the backend. We managed to, to insert a few new features in the Docker file. But, but yeah, I, I believe at some point in the future, I, I mean, there is no plan right now, but we could see, a, like, I don't know, Docker file v2 that would be more complex than just basic lines. Uh, so yeah, definitely, I mean, we are really trying to decouple the, the back end of the builder from the, from the front end. So maybe in the, future, in, the, in the future, we could even support Docker files and something else, your, your custom, Custom front end, as long as, uh, as it can talk to the to the Docker builder backend, it would work. Cool, thank you. Sure. Just following up on a previous question, will there be any way in the future to extend this multi-stage uh, Docker file to copy layers instead of copying files from a previous Docker image? I mean, that's a great suggestion. Today, it's not on the roadmap, but uh, I mean, I'm. We gladly, gladly talk to the team and, and work on it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess it would be because, it would be I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense as of now, since uh, especially that case where you do a, a, a build something where you have no idea what files are gonna generate it. Docker itself, as long as you have a command line, it yeah. generates a layer, so it means, it almost looks like all the information is there, you just need to kind of take that layer and attach it to the next phase. Yeah, I think it's definitely doable. Uh, so it, it comes back to the previous question. The thing is here, the syntax of the Docker file, it's not really practical. I mean, I don't know how it would look like maybe a copy from and you have to give the, the line of your Docker file. It can make, make it well, messy, so. I, I was thinking something that you have like the from us something where you pretty much you tag it the same way you can do a run something us something else and you can reference it or. Yeah, something. I mean, that's, that's, that's definitely a good, good idea. Thank you. Um, what about uh, plugins for the uh, scheduling? Like you talked about the new, um, uh, the, the, the balancing across the different nodes, the different racks. I mean, is there, is, it, is that thought of? Uh, that's definitely on the roadmap today. Now you cannot uh, really specify the scheduler. Um, we have uh, one that is uh, spreading, but that's pretty much it. Uh, today, the plugins we have uh, are not orchestration plugin yet. Uh, it's, as I was saying, it's just like logging, volume, um, networks. It's, it's definitely some, something we would like to have, uh, a way to drop your own scheduling uh, and replacing basically the, the orchestrating part of, of SwarmKit. Uh, so it's not on the, on the roadmap, but it's, it's a, it would be a very cool feature to have, yeah. On the scheduling front, uh, anti-affinity? So, to be fair, I don't think they're in, maybe they are, uh, so I would encourage to uh, at least ask the, the people who will do the, the swarm, swarm session. I mean, it's definitely on the roadmap. It's uh, something we had before with the, the old swarm, so it's, it's coming for sure. 
Right. Thank you very much.